Today we are starting with a panel which is particularly dear in a keynote speech, dear to my heart, because there are two very special women um, who I'm welcoming today and who are setting us up um, for the day. Um, it is Eva Deininger, who is a very good friend of Aspen and uh, a member of our um, Friends of Aspen board. Um, and you have been pivotal in supporting um, Aspen over the last years. Um, and a good old friend, Gabriela Ramos, um, who is going to be introduced by Eva just in a second. And um, I just want to say about Gabriela, she is a power woman. She keeps everybody on her toes. And I know this from the German G20 presidency when I was responsible for the business 20, where she really kept me on my toes saying, where's the responsibility of business? And I think we are going to hear a little bit more about this. So thank you so much for uh, being here today. And the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Darling. Good morning to everyone, also, also from myself, here in the representation of Baden-Württemberg, my home country, the land, <laughs> um, and over, also over the live stream um, on the internet. I'm delighted to start with you, Gabriella, on this um, spotlight talk where you are very happy to have you here in person, despite of the COVID situation. I think the conference couldn't be better at this time because on November 24th, you um, uh, had a comprehensive global standard setting instrument. You provided the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. So I'm very curious about to hear how you got there to this enormous paper with this amazing content and um, to hear what are the next steps after your spotlight. But before, I want to give some insights about your amazing CV and what you're doing now. Gabriela is the assistant, Gabriela Ramos, to get the whole name, is the assistant director general for the social and human sciences of UNESCO, where she oversees the contributions of the institution to build inclusive and peaceful societies. So her agenda includes social inclusion and gender equality, advancing youth development, promotion of values, anti-racism, anti-discriminatory agendas, and our topic today, the ethics of AI. So, I'm very, very happy to hear about all this. You served as the chief of staff and chairperson to the G20 and G7 before, as we heard from Stormy. And in 2019, you launched the Business for Inclusive Growth Platform. So you are really connected also to the, to the big companies and the operational business. And you were director of the OECD office in Mexico and Latin America. So a really powerful woman. So the floor is you, and we are very happy to hear what you're telling us about the latest news on the recommendation the 20, which came out the 24th of November. Thank you so much. Uh, so I got there for my initial presentation. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, Stormy. Thank you, Aspen Institute and the, the foundations. Uh, 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 I would say that if, if Stormy calls, I come. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are two of a kind, and I'm, I'm really admiring this very impressive work. Uh, the, the, the title of the conference is Humanity Empowered. And I think this is the way we should be talking about artificial intelligence. This is the way we see it in, um, in the, in, in, at UNESCO. Uh, but I feel that now that we have 193 countries approving this very ambitious recommendation by a standing ovation at the general conference in um, last week at UNESCO, it tells you that there is something that is bringing us together in terms of how we need to redress the way we have been uh, advancing these technologies to make them sustainable. I have to say that uh, we are all at awe of how much contributions, how many contributions artificial intelligence can make. We know it. I mean, they help us to find a vaccine in less than one year without their churning and tracking and um, analyzing all the patterns of the virus. I don't think that would have been possible. We know how much they can help in any, every single step of, uh, of, our life, uh, of our lives. But at the same time, we are concerned about many issues. And I think this is very, very linked to the question of resilience. Because if, if the, if the, if the uh, systems that we have been developing have vulnerabilities in terms of protecting people, in terms of respecting human rights of people, we have something that is not sustainable and that is not resilience. 
And this is how I want to frame it, because of course in UNESCO we frame it human rights, period. <laughs> the ethical framework is about respecting human rights online as we do it offline, which is not still the case. So what are the issues there? First, if, uh, if, 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 the systems, if the systems are being used to meddle with our democracies and with our minds, I mean, they are being used, not by everybody, <laughs> thanks God, but, but they have produced outcomes in terms of how elections are conducted and how much you can profile and target people with messages that raise concerns and trigger certain behaviors. This is not sustainable. This is really uh, very worrisome. Um, if, um, if we are constantly being um, targeted in terms of really protecting your privacy, in terms of every time you go to the, to the internet and, and get something, uh, you don't know what is going to happen really with your information. And the fact is that uh, even if there is consent and even if there is GDPR and we have improved the way these things work, the fact is that we still do not know how our information is being used. Do you know? We don't. We know that, of course, you put certain information in the, in the, in the, in the system and you get uh, some outcomes with, uh, with uh, all of the algorithms, but the fact is that we're still not uh, on top of the issues. And this is more worrisome because of COVID. Of course, because there has been a massive uh, uh, gathering of data, which is normal because we are in a crisis. Uh, but uh, there has been 60% increase in internet traffic and leaving uh, online footprints exposed uh, to all these uh, things. Finally, uh, we are subject to algorithmic determination every day. And many decisions are being taken with the support of uh, artificial intelligence without full transparency. And therefore, what is the quality of data? What is the framework, the conceptual framework of the algorithms? How much we are really taking into account that they are representative, that they are not biased? Well, this is not true because we have known for many uh, anecdotes or examples or, or, or just the scandals, plain scandals as we have heard from the Facebook uh, whistleblower. But in general, we know that many times uh, facial recognition technologies are less, are less capable of recognizing women. Why? Well, because probably women are less present. And we know because only 20% of the AI developers are women. 85% of AI developments are done by male-only teams. Nothing wrong with men. The only point is that they represent certain view of the world that then when you ask the, the machine to produce certain outcomes, of course they are biased. And this is really one of the questions that we were tackling in the, in the, in the recommendation on how to make it more inclusive, how to make it more um, in, uh, representative. And then there is a the question of uh, the business model. Um, five countries producing the totality of, uh, or the majority of, uh, of these technologies uh, 200 companies producing 77% of the IPRs. And again, this is not that we are going to uh, uh, punish these innovative businesses. <laughs> the only point is that if you have half of the world not connected, this is not sustainable. And therefore we need, or, or you have uh, a small, a small startups uh, growing and then being bought because you have these very big tech uh, firms that can also acquire any kind of development, we are hurting. We are even hurting innovation because we have yesterday a very interesting conversation about how much regulation can hurt innovation. The fact is that now I would say that the very high concentration and the winner takes all dynamics is hurting innovation. Monopolies hurt innovation and we are uh, really heading into this uh, situation. So the point is how do you tackle all, all that while preserving and keeping a very positive uh, message about these technologies and the response of UNESCO and the 193 countries that, that uh, signed this recommendation is that we need to frame these technologies ethically. What does that mean? That we need to put the values that we have in terms of human rights, human dignity, uh, uh, democratic values, uh, well-being of people, respect, as the frame, then you need some principles that we know them because I was also at the OECD and the principles are very straightforward. We all know them. 
accountability, transparency, explainability, proportionality, all these principles. But then you cannot just stay with the principles because the main call of the recommendation is to say, let's transform that into rules and regulations and legal infrastructure in the countries that don't have them or have them not very well developed to ensure that we have the rule of law online. And this is exactly what we did. We produced these principles and then we didn't stop there because of course UNESCO came, let's say if you compare all the other institutions that produce principles for AI, we came a little bit late because in the OECD we produced it to 2019, the Council of Europe, the European Union of course has been dealing with these issues for so many years. But the fact is that we, what we said was, okay, uh, let's then translate this into policy action. And I think this is one of the most important contributions that this recommendation is doing. Because we translate what we consider to be the framework into policy action in education, in communication, to avoid hate speech, for example, or misinformation, uh, in culture, to ensure diversity, because again, there is not diversity. You have only one language or mainly one language uh, producing the majority of the issues and therefore the diversity of the world, the cultural, cultural richness of the world is also not being captured. We, we did it also on the question of the environment and I'm happy that we will have another panel. And this was actually after a, a very global, a, impressive consultation because this is UNESCO style. We don't produce the thing. It, it was 24 uh, experts all around the world, representing all the countries, all the regions of the world that produced the first text. We went out to a very broad consultation, 55,000 comments, and one of the outcomes of those consultations was, what about the environment? And so we have a chapter on the environment and how to align the AI developments to uh, our goals to climate transition. Gender, again, if we feel that women are not represented in several uh, areas of, of our uh, activities, uh, in AI world is just even less, even lower than being represented in STEM. And therefore we build all these uh, chapters and we will be uh, delivering very concretely data. Everything is about data and there is a very strong call for people to own their data, to be able to retrieve, access your data, but also delete your data, to know where is it going and how it's being used. The ethical stewardship of these things the ethical stewardship of algorithms, the ethical stewardship of how it is developed in the whole life cycle, the research, development, deployment, the, the ethical reflection about the diversity of the teams. And this is pretty straightforward. If you don't have diverse teams, how can you control the, the, the biases and, and all the things as we know them? And then, of course, the question of the governance of these technologies and how much we need to have frameworks, legal frameworks, that would actually do something that is impressive, but we are not able yet when something goes wrong um, in the public or private use of AI, we have not been able to allocate directly the responsibility and accountability and redressal mechanisms. So this is where we are. I think that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long journey because it's, a, it's gonna take quite some time. I have to say that they, um, the members also ask us to do two things that we are uh, super interested in, and I invite the Aspen Institute and all of you to join us in building two tools that we are asked to do. The first one is the ethical impact assessment that can be used for the public and private sector. And the second one is the readiness assessment because recognizing the very different level of development, uh, we need to work with low income and developing countries so they can also not only be consumers or users because they are now, but be also developers to try to advance uh, solutions for their own challenges. And uh, I want to thank Japan because they are now working with us to implement the recommendation in uh, Africa. So this is where we are. It's a, it's a long journey. Not only it was um, approved by a standing ovation, and let me tell you that it was very interesting because me coming from the OECD, when I arrived there, I was like, how do you negotiate with 150, 93 countries? You get a good chair <laughs> of the negotiations. And I got Ambassador uh, Adam Almula from Kuwait, who is fantastic. And then when, when the thing went uh, out and, and people got so excited about what they have achieved, that they said, we want to be the early adopters. And now I have like, 30 countries, including Germany. So I'm very proud that, because Germany played a fantastic role. I have to say thanks. Thank you, Germany. Uh, but we now have a group of 25 countries also from all over the world, Brazil, Mexico, um, um, 
the Colombia and uh, Germany and the Netherlands and the UK and Japan and Namibia and Kenya and Egypt uh, wanting to be early adopters, to start working. Because in any case, if, even if you don't do anything, if you don't, you don't join this, uh, this work, um, you will need to report back because UNESCO has this mechanism of reporting how you implement it. But this is where we are. Thanks a lot. As you said, implementation, just, I'm very curious, how do the countries, or what are the aims to implement it now? What are the next steps and how do they have to get the um, issues back to you that you know that there is an impl implementation? Well, uh, the fact is that what we are going to do now is to put all of the, all of the, um, framework, the framework as it is now, in terms of the, of the ethical stewardship, in terms of the human rights, in terms of how we manage the data, the diversity of the teams, into some kind of uh, blueprint so that countries can assess where they are in terms of the continuum. So the, the recommendation, you can see it as a benchmark. Mm -hmm. the, the, the things that you have there is where we need to go. Uh, it was very interesting because even some countries uh, like the UK or the Netherlands, uh, when they read the recommendation, they came and said, well, I thought I was going to be on top, but I'm not. <laughs> so we need to that, that, do that assessment. I have to say again that Germany is a pioneer because uh, your National Commission for UNESCO has already launched, and I think they are now uh, discussing, uh, Mr. Lutz, uh, um, this assessment to see how much the legal infrastructure that you have, the policies that you have related to all the things that I mentioned are really uh, in line with the recommendation. Once we have that, we are going to create a group that is going to be um, our basis to bring the policy experts and do the, the peer learning, the peer pressure, uh, learning from each other. And, and of course, the recommendation also asks us to produce a lot of knowledge, analytical, because we need to, to, to document all this. And the assessment, is it about the poli politics and the regulations, or is it also going down to the companies and to the real world who is then dealing with those issues? For us, uh, it's the member states that need to uh, upscale the, the legal infrastructure. Uh, and it's very interesting that many times we hear like, uh, what do you think the, the, the companies will think? I'm like, well, I don't think that the government asks companies whether they can be uh, regulated for good. Uh, I know that, uh, that and, and, and Stormy and I have spoken so many years on how to avoid uh, really burdensome regulations. And, and yes, we need effective regulation. But I think that the time of self-regulation is over. So yes, we are going to do it in a multi-stakeholder approach because uh, the ones that know also how things work are, are the companies. But it's the government that is going to be uh, developing the, the, the infrastructure to address these issues. In any case, um, there are two parts of this recommendation. If you tell me what are the main concerns that really countries had. First, of course, is the very unbalanced uh, power distribution in the economic world, because you have the big companies, and even for the small and medium-sized enterprises, it's not easy to compete. Um, we have the misuse of this uh, in the private sector, and first for, for, for um, commercial purposes, no, the, the, the maximizing uh, the money, the, the money, and also but maximizing, as, as we've heard so many times, um, the airtime where people are connected and the impact it has to in our youth, in our, in our girls, in our children. Uh, but you also have the massive surveillance, and we're so, so by, by authoritarian regimes. And we're very proud that uh, the recommendation includes uh, some provisions that ban mass surveillance, ban social scoring, um, and, and bring really the, the debate into, into a higher level. So it's for governments to implement. All the things we say is for governments. But the companies will need to rethink because they are going to be concerned. Uh, certainly. Uh, coming probably right on to the companies, um, Regulation for me is one point, but in the end, it's also a leadership issue. Um, how, how do we get this ethical values um, into the leadership? What do you think? How, 
how do we educate also old people to think on these issues, to get known from those harms or those things who really doesn't want to do us good things. So for me, it's also a leadership issue if the company is going for ethical issues or not, and then it's a business issue. Um, if you are open and you open your data and you let extract the users, the data of, for example, LinkedIn or something, the possibility to extract and go to another site is much more easier or to use them without using the platform or the product. So what do you think where, where to start also on this leadership issues to, to educate? Well, I think that it, it, it's call, it calls on all these issues. And as you say, I was, I was uh, heading with uh, Danone, with Emmanuel Faber, the business for inclusive growth. This kind of mentality of the 40 big companies that joined us, not only to go for uh, corporate social responsibility, which is fine, and I would not deny that we continue to need this uh, very strong commitment, but the company saying we are really in a world that is so highly unique, unequal that is going to hurt us. This kind of mentality, recognizing that, that the way these technologies are proceeding might create a social backlash against the technologies, which is what we want to avoid. If people start seeing that their children are being lured into radicalization, as it happened uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous years in, with the European children and France, uh, if you think that your girls are getting this uh, depression or, or uh, being targeted, or uh, of course there's going to be a backlash. So I think that it's very important for companies, as you say, to show leadership, to step up and say, no, I'm going to join this ethical, uh, and we invite the companies to join the, the, the ethical um, uh, infrastructure. We need to be careful because it's true that uh, when talking with some of the leading figures of, of, uh, that are calling for a change of the model, um, the ethical framework can also provide with um, window dressing. And that's why the recommendation is very concrete in saying the ethical framework needs to translate into respect of human rights. Because human rights are codified. <laughs> You have the, the right not to be uh, uh, molested, you have the right not to be abused, you have to freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of agency. We're worried about neurotechnologies being used to, to, to uh, manipulate, which is happening. It's not, yeah. it's not by chance that if you get all this uh, hate speech against uh, migrants or, or people from other uh, origins, that, that then people go out and do things that are completely unacceptable. But it's because these technologies are being misused. So yes, and I think there's so many companies that are really stepping up because we also work with the companies. We work with the International Chamber of Commerce and, uh, and actually we have uh, Rolls Royce and, and many companies that are working with us to, 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 to go for this race to the top because this is what we want with companies and with governments to go for a race to the top. Okay, one point for me interesting as before I give over to the audience is the data issue, data and algorithms. Um, a lot of the data comes in, you can say what, what data comes in, it goes also out. How do we get to a gender equalized data collection, for example? I know that the data collection between women and man is completely different, you, as you told already. How do you think we can do more steps forward that we have a better data collection in the countries? I mean, in this COVID pan pandemic, I was, I was quite surprised how less Women. our government also focused on, or we know real, we get real data where we can, as a person, then say, okay, I have the data, I can do my decision for my own and I know. So how do you think this data collection can be on an equalized women, men, can be better to, to have a better data for better algorithms and then also um, better artificial intelligence? Well, I would say that you first need to recognize it. You cannot just go with low quality data that is not representative, build up 
the, the, the developments, uh, then get uh, conceptual frameworks with the algorithm and the training of data, also biased, because you only have male-only teams. And then the outcome is like, oh my God, but what happened with Amazon? My God, they launched this recruitment tool and they did not include a single woman. And not only not include a single woman, they rejected all the CVs from women. I mean, let's not be naive. Well, let's then look at the model and let's say, okay, if it's more difficult to gather data from women, from women let's do a special effort to do it. But then I think that the quality of the data set is super important. And I don't think that this is recognized enough. Now with all these uh, scandals, we, we get to see that, uh, yes, there are cer certain groups and certain uh, people, only half of the world population, only women, no? That <laughs> might not be as, as, as uh, uh, represented, represented uh, in, the, in the information that, that uh, fits all these systems. But I think that just recognizing that. And then there is some, some trucks that comes not for the technology, but for what we know about gender equality. What about asking, uh, asking companies and asking countries that are developing the, uh, the technologies to have uh, diverse teams? What about, and this is what the recommendation is saying, we have affirmative action. We know, and I know that is, it has been difficult, but you have a quota for boards corporate posts, and we're still not yet there, but you have it. Well, let's make sure that the teams that develop the technologies always have a woman. Or a pretty diverse. Or really. diverse, or somebody coming from another country, or somebody coming from another region, or from another socioeconomic. And we call also to be open to the civil society participation, to be more transparent. There is, we are not naive because there is a balance to be done. They are IPR issues. All the, all the algorithms that are, are related to IPR. And it's not that you're just going to open it up and give it to everybody because that's not how the world works. But the fact is that this also needs to be balanced. And actually the, the recommendation also say that when there is very strong uh, harm, people has the right to know. And people has the right to know how this was built, how the, the algorithm was built. And therefore in the deployment, because we took a, a whole AI life cycle for this, you have the developers, and so let's make, make, make the team diverse. Let's have the team develop the whole thing. Do check-ups, because we say, oh, but then there is a black box and the machine learning, and then we don't know how it comes. No, sorry, you can put some controls. You can, you can just stop and say, how are you doing? And then uh, uh, keep up the, the whole thing. And then at the end, what is very important is that there is human determination. Because it's not like the technologies come from the outer space and tell you what to do. No. At the end, when the whole exercise is on, you need to have human judgment, <laughs> whether I use the outcomes or not. And I think that these, these kind of very easy steps should be followed. Very good. I think, looking at the time, I will open the questions for the audience. Do we have questions? Please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm with the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace. And I have two questions. The first is uh, in the document, um, you have very often uh, reference to human dignity. In the uh, uh, EU regulatory package, uh, you have, uh, you know, some applications which should be banned because it goes against human dignity, like social scoring. So social scoring was certainly an issue. And my question is, you know, uh, how you have dealt with the social scoring and what are the implications now for uh, this application? And the second question refers to uh, autonomous weapon systems. I think in the document you have also a clear paragraph that decisions on life and death should not be, should not be referred to AI systems. So we have the negotiations on laws and so they have now introduced a new category, partial autonomous weapon system. Anyhow, you know, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations is asking for a ban of autonomous weapon systems. So, 
uh, military issues are outside of the scope of UNESCO. But I would be interested, you know, how you have discussed this and could this document now be used to promote a ban of autonomous weapon systems? Thank you very much. Very good questions. <laughs> Well, first of all, I have to say that on the social scoring, the recommendation is very clear and it's banned. It should be banned. And therefore, um, we will need to follow up on that. And I know it's difficult and I know that it's being used and I know that uh, uh, th there are whole systems that are being ba built on, on this basis, uh, but it's, it's forbidden. So we will follow up on that. On the question of weapons, um, there was a very, very intense discussion among our, our member states. And I have to say that uh, it was very interesting because sometimes in the UN system, you feel, you feel these lines of north, south, east, west, developing countries, uh, advanced countries. In the case of the, of the weapons, the, the debates were uh, really among everybody. Some countries saying it needs to be in the recommendation. We're not going to be credible if we don't ban autonomous weapons, because this is exactly is the, is the representation of the worst fears of autonomy to a system. And we are also saying that uh, this should be uh, um, taken care of very closely, how autonomous the systems can be. And also how much uh, we also say that uh, artificial intelligence should not have systems should not have legal personality. So that's another uh, benchmark that we're proposing them. But the conclusion was that uh, first is not the mandate of UNESCO, as you say. We are not dealing with weapons and therefore uh, we should not get into, into that. Uh, but what we got as a, as a compromise was exactly what you referred to. The fact is that whenever there is a decision related to life and death, it should be uh, human uh, based and it should be uh, based on the, on the final uh, call by, by humans. So, so uh, laws and regulations and jurisprudence is always uh, advanced with this, uh, uh, no, with, this paper, with these negotiations and with these agreements. So I hope that it will be uh, serving good purposes for other settings, but that's in the hands of members. Uh, I, can, I can tell you my, my personal opinion uh, <laughs> privately. <laughs> Tommy, you had another question. Um, if, I, if I may, um, I, I do have so many questions. <laughs> um, but one question I wanted to ask you is about, about your team um, yourself um, at, at uh, UNESCO. Um, when I started at, at Espen um, and I told my husband I'm going to do a conference on AI, he was first saying, what do you know about AI? Because he is one of those people that was voice doing AI. Mm -hmm. And then um, he said uh, to me, I'm going to show you some codes now and how it works. And that was a little bit of an eye opener to me um, that it's not just the, the, the coders um, who need to have the thinking about ethics. It's also the government people people who are talking about AI and digitalization to understand what we are really talking about. So what I wanted to ask you is, how is your team um, set up? Do you have coders? Uh, is it very diverse? Um, yeah. how, how do you learn from each other? That's a super good question. The fact is that, uh, let me tell you that I have the strongest, the strongest team ever uh, Davna Feinholz, uh, who actually is a Mexican, even, even the name <laughs> doesn't look Mexican, but she's a fantastic lady, uh, and a team of um, 15 people that are um, ethicists. They know about ethics. Uh, they were the ones that built the Declaration on Human Genome, and they are the ones that have been building up the bioethics committees in, in, in member states. Um, so they have this uh, very uh, strong knowledge on the regulatory and legal frameworks related to how to in interject ethics in the, in the legal processes. Uh, but you're right, uh, no great expertise in terms of the algorithms and the data. Of course, uh, you, you, of cor uh, UNESCO is not only based on the, on the secretariat. What we did was exactly to bring 24 fantastic experts, but it was different, you know, because it's not about coding. Coding you learn, 
that we learn. And I have Maria Gracia Squicciarini who joined my team as my executive officer and she's top notch coder and she has been uh, looking at innovation and patents and the, the data that I gave you about the 77% is hers. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is to have a multidisciplinary, a more inclusive debate because if you have just the technical people talking to the technical people, this is what we have because it has been technically driven. You need to bring, you know what? We brought the philosophers, we brought the sociologists, we brought the psychologists to talk to each other in these 24 global fantastic experts, actually led by Emma Rodkamp Bloom, who is a, a professor in South Africa. She was the chair of the expert groups. And I have to tell you that yes, they have to check with the technologist uh, how much this is possible, how this can be framed. But, but the conversation actually should be the other way around. It's not about the technology. It's about how the technology is going to help with our own challenges as humans and how they're going to help us to have more inclusive societies, to deal with inequalities, to deal with climate change, to deal. And for that, you don't need the coders. <laughs> Sorry, coders. No, we will. We will be. We will, we will be need them. Relying on them, of course, <laughs> to translate this into something that is feasible. We need them, but it's but it's bigger than that. It's, it's changing the nature of the conversation. Isn't it uh, to bring those issues to the whole society, from those who use it to those who program it, but also the leaders that we come to the question: how we come to this thinking that it's that we want to do it for good and not for, not for bad. No, but the, the fact is that it's everybody because AI is pervasive and ethics is about all of us. And the fact is that, uh, yes, the, the developers should have this framework, but also the users. And that's why in the recommendation, we also have the question of education. Mm. And, and, and UNESCO is the leading agency for education. And we are looking at how to uh, instill this critical thinking in this massive amount of information that we receive, how you critically can determine which is good source, which is bad source, which is uh, something that you can trust and which is something that you cannot trust. And therefore is for, is for everybody. Uh, very good point uh, of Stormy. The fact is that how do we ensure, and you said it, uh, Eva, the question of, uh, of, of government capacities. We don't have them. Yesterday I was listening to your debates. There are many good people in the governments, but when you want to attract more people to help you to build up the systems in the governments, but also the legal, the legal infrastructure, the fact is that you cannot compete with the private sector because the data scientists and all these uh, fantastic uh, experts, uh, no, you need to bring them almost. And yesterday was your, your German representative who said, we need to bring them because they have the vocation of the public service. And so I said, yes, please, <laughs> because we cannot compete. Uh, but I, I'm sure that we will have more and more people uh, really providing their expertise to these very important points. Is there any more questions in the audience? Please. Janet Lieberherr, ich habe ein Privatinstitut für Innovation. Uh, sorry, Janet Lieberherr, uh, I founded a private institute for innovation culture, and I come from a psychological perspective on, on different uh, things concerning um, IA, um, AI. And uh, my question is uh, congratulations first to have uh, 193. Uh, countries um, coming together to agree on basic human values. Um, which country did not sign and are there reasons why they didn't? Well, we have a big country that didn't sign because they are not members of UNESCO, which is the US. But they participated because they were uh, always uh, as observers represented. And I was very proud to see that uh, in one of the conversations, the assistant secretary for um, uh, IOS, she said, we need to be in that table. Uh, and we will be working with them because we also work with uh, many institutions and many experts uh, in the US, um, but, uh, but we will need to work with them. In any case, I can tell you that it's very interesting because um, when we were 
finishing the, the, the whole negotiation, there were some countries telling me, yes, but you cannot impose this framework to developing countries because you will need, they would need to be uh, building all this infrastructure instead of developing the technologies. And, and that gave me a hint that uh, if you are in the commercial race or the geopolitical race to be the leader and the uh, you will notice that UNESCO was there because we now have all the countries, the developing countries, going to adopt the framework. And we're starting, as I said, working with many countries in Africa. And therefore, if you are a, a seller of the technologies or leader in the technologies, you will find that the, that the new construction will be based in this recommendation. So I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm really sure that everybody is going to be engaging one way or another. We have. Yeah. Um, I must say I am a little bit surprised by your comment about not having the coders in the as part of the conversation. I say this because I am professor of computer science, so I am from the side of artificial intelligence and, and, and algorithms and so on. And I think they must be part of the conversation because they have to hear what it is said. Otherwise, you won't have in them thinking about ethical aspects because it comes from outside. It is exogenous. They don't deal with that. And my experience is in the last years, there is a need for people coming from the technical side to learn about these implications. All they do is, all they want to do is improve technology, develop the algorithms and so on. And they don't have maybe the knowledge or the, the capacity or maybe the time or maybe, I don't know, to, to get or to dive into those aspects that are now the most important ones. And this is why I would say maybe they cannot contribute as a legal, a legal person, ethical uh, uh, expert or philosophers uh, to the framework and so on, to the implications worldwide and, and so on. But they have the other side that is actually the one that is bringing such issues uh, in the society and in the conversations. So in my experience, in my opinion, they should be there in order to hear, in order to learn what they must learn what we must learn in order to come together and to go into the same direction. Otherwise, we will have both sides disconnected. And I think this should not be the case in the yeah, mid-term future, long-term future, because we will have technologies for a long time. And some, as I suppose, that the framework and all the things will change with changes in society, in our um, yeah, uh, moral uh, stance, with the development we have in politics and so on. This will change according to how we change as humans, as uh, societies, as countries. But technologies will be there in the future and will have a more and more deep impact in our lives. So I think they must be there to learn. We should be there, there to learn, to contribute in some way, but especially to learn from those things, not after regulation is put uh, in, in practice, but in the way, in the path to this regulation too. What I think. No, I'm, I'm actually very happy that you're uh, doing that question because uh, uh, I never said that they are not part of it. Uh, I said that uh, it should be broader. Of course they are. They should be. You are completely right. I think that if, if, if they are not part of the group, part of the conversation, uh, we might get it wrong from the technological point of view. What I'm saying is that it's not about only the technology. Because what is happening is that we are, have been in this race to, to, to be the leaders in the technological front without due consideration of these other aspects. And the second part of what you say is what I really agree, because it's not about uh, uh, signaling the technologies because how they can be producing these things that are harmful. No, it's not for them. They just go and do what they know how to do, which is to create solutions through the technological developments 
Uh, the only point is how do we bring more ethical thinking whenever these things are being developed, which I think has been lacking in many instances. So it's, it's, I would say that, yes, we want the coders to become more uh, ethics uh, uh, savvy and the ethical experts to understand how the code and all these things work. Uh, so they go together and we had, we had. Uh, uh, coders and we had uh, actually I brought also uh, three new members of my team that that know these things and it's fantastic because, because then they can tell you no 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 let me tell you how this works <laughs> and then you see okay but you know the fact is that the, the technologies don't happen in a vacuum neither and this is what we're we're saying we're saying we need a, 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 a an environment an ecosystem that will uh, dedicate more efforts more funds, more incentives to produce AI technologies that help us address our challenges. And this is exactly what we're doing there. We would say, be aware of the impact of some AI developments that uh, just one single model will, uh, to run one single model takes 125 trips equals, no? you know this figure, 125 trips from New York to, uh, to Beijing. Uh, just be aware. And then, of course, as we do with climate, if, if Rockstar, uh, uh, the, this uh, big investor comes out and say, I'm not going to invest in, in, in companies that are uh, investing in coal or fossil fuels, you change the incentives. This is what we want to create because I'm an economist. I know how to use these uh, uh, instruments. It's not to impose top down without understanding the nature of the, of the, of the, of the technological e ecosystem is to align that ecosystem to our values and to we want to get out. And it's, it concerns us all. Let me tell you also that for the 55,000 uh, questions, uh, uh, comments that we received from the global consultation, we suddenly finished with 55,000 comments for the text. And we're like, what are we going to do? Well, we use artificial intelligence. <laughs> and Irkai, the, hopefully the, for good. <laughs> for good. And, and Irkai, who is the, this fantastic institute in, in Slovenia, a category two center of UNESCO on artificial intelligence, they brought all the experts to, to, to boil down these uh, comments into the text, into something that, uh, that made sense. So it's, I think it has to be super inclusive. That's, that's the point. I think it was a very good final statement. The time is over and I'm very unhappy because I have several more questions. <laughs> but thank you very much, Gabriel, for these wonderful insights and this new latest news. And um, please enjoy the further conference. Thank you so much, Yvonne. It has been my pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much.